In this video, I'm going to go into some more detail on kinetic and static friction. Recall that static friction is the frictional force that prevents an object from sliding. I also want you to understand that static friction has a maximum threshold, after which the object will be set into motion. We refer to that as the force of static friction maximum. On the other hand, the force of kinetic friction is that frictional force that opposes motion when the object is sliding. I'm now going to take you to a PHET simulation to compare and contrast static and kinetic friction. Okay, so I'm going to apply a 50 Newton force to the right on the crate. Notice the crate does not move. Also notice that there is a frictional force to the left that is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. This is a force of static friction. The force of static friction will match the force applied until the object is set into motion. In other words, until I reach that threshold of the force of static friction maximum. Let me double the force. The crate remains stationary. Therefore, the current force of static friction would be 100 newtons to the left. We have not yet reached the threshold. Now I am going to go up to the threshold of 126 newtons. I'd like for you to look at the force vector, please, now, and note what happens. At 126 newtons, this object is set into motion. In other words, 126 newtons is that threshold, the force at which this crate will accelerate. The net force is now to the right. Look at the speedometer. It is increasing over time. And now we are dealing with the force of kinetic friction. We're also switching to the coefficient of kinetic friction when analyzing this scenario. Now I'm going to decrease the force applied and I'm going to decrease to match the frictional force, which occurs at 94 Newtons. At 94 Newtons, notice the speed. It now remains constant. This means that the rightward force applied is equal in magnitude opposite in direction to the leftward force applied by the road onto the crate. In other words, the force of static friction is equal in magnitude to the force applied. Now what I want you to bring to me tomorrow are your calculations for both the force of kinetic friction and the force of static friction Moreover, I want you to find the value for the coefficient of static friction and the coefficient of kinetic friction from this scenario. In the simulation, you saw that static friction matched the force applied until that threshold was reached. And again, that's the force of static friction maximum. Let us sum the forces for this scenario Let's call right positive and left negative. So we're subtracting the force of static friction from the force applied. And of course, the object was not accelerating. Therefore, the right side of the expression becomes zero. And we can say that force applied was equal to the force of static friction. Therefore, the force of static friction matched the force applied. Now, you can always substitute in mass gravity right here into the physics is fun equation. I want you to remember that. That is very important. I also would like to mention that this maximum threshold, this maximum force occurred at 126 newtons. After 126 newtons, the crate began to slide and we were dealing with the force of kinetic friction. Now let's look at your College Board Equations sheet, and I want to talk to you now about why this is written as an inequality and why there are modulus bars as part of that inequality. First and foremost, this is applying to the force of static friction, and it's true. The frictional force was less than coefficient of friction multiplied by force normal. It was less than that. It matched force applied. 
all the way up until we hit the maximum threshold, at which point they were equal to one another. The force of friction, static friction maximum was equal to mu multiplied by force normal at that maximum threshold. After that time, when the object slides, you're going to be using this equation, the one that I will typically just write on the board and refer to as the physics is fun. Also, because the force of friction always opposes the motion, it's very intuitive to assign a direction on the coordinate system for the force of friction. If I'm applying a force to the right, the force of friction is to the left. If an object is sliding to the right and decelerating, well, that is because the force of friction is to the left. So it's very intuitive. Also, consider the coordinate system here. We have frictional forces acting horizontally in this simulation, and we have force normal acting vertically in this situation. So that is why we just take the absolute value, and then it's common sense to assign a direction based on your defined coordinate system, since it always opposes the motion. Now, let's take a look at this graph. In an upcoming lab, you're going to create a very similar graph with Logger Pro and your LabQuest 2 unit. We typically refer to this as a drag test, where you're dragging an object across the surface, and then you can experimentally determine the value for the coefficient of friction. So in the first portion of this graph, I want you to see as we've gone over and we even sum the forces to show it that the force of static friction matched the force applied. All the way up until this threshold, labeled break-free point in which the object begins to be set into motion. There's a net force setting it into motion. Also notice that after this threshold, and again, the inequality applies to here, but once we get here, we know that the force of static friction does equal and remember, we're using a coefficient of static friction. And then, of course, it force normal if the surface is horizontal. If the object's on a horizontal surface, force normal would be mass times the acceleration due to gravity. That changes when we're on an incline. Now, what do we notice about the force of kinetic friction after the break-free point? It's less than that maximum force of static always less than the maximum force of static. And because it's now in motion, we use a different coefficient of friction, mu sub k, for kinetic friction. So you're going to need to know this graph. Make sure you copy it down into your notes, please. Now, the one you will generate in lab will look more like this. Again, you can see this maximum threshold here, after which this object begins to slide, you can see kinetic friction is less than the force of friction, static friction maximum. And then if you're wondering what's happening here, that's just when the object was no longer being slid across the surface. So this is very similar to what you're graphs will look like on the LabQuest 2 unit when we do this lab. Here are some values for mu. As I said in a previous video, and as you will do in lab, it is determined experimentally. You can see static friction on the left for mu is always greater than on the right. And please recall that these interactions um, between the two surfaces are a result of microscopic interactions that are occurring, causing the force of static and kinetic friction. Now let's look at an example here, and I want to talk about this person who's walking to the right, walking their dog. And I want to once again revisit and apply Newton's third law. Now let's look at the shoe person's moving to the right, but the force of the shoe on the ground, okay, force of the shoe on the ground, let's look at that, is actually to the left. 
Now this trips a lot of students up and what I would tell you to do is imagine if you're trying to run on ice. That helps understand that this force of the shoe on the ground is to the left. Other words, otherwise you'd be slipping. And that is equal to the opposite of the force of the ground onto the shoe. Those are the that's the mutual pair, our action reaction pairs for Newton's third law. And so what's really cool to think about this is what propels or moves this person forward is actually the force of the ground on the shoe. That's what's moving this person forward. So the shoe exerts a force to the left on the ground and the ground exerts a force on the shoe to the right and the person is moving to the right. And I think that's a really cool example. Last thing I want to talk to you about would be an object on an incline. And so if an object is sliding up an incline, which way would be the force of kinetic friction? Down and parallel to the incline. Now, when you're using physics as fun here, you're actually not using mg. Think about that for a minute. The force normal is perpendicular to the surface, but the surface is no longer horizontal. It's at some angle above horizontal, theta. So recall the geometry that I've taught you about for forces on an incline and for motion in general on an incline. You will actually get mg cosine theta to be equal to force normal. And if you're wondering where that came from, I would love for you to sum the forces and try to figure it out on your own or come in tomorrow and I'll show you again where this comes from. But force normal is mass gravity cosine theta for an object on an incline. So it is less than, it is a component of the force of gravity. Very cool. All right, and then lastly, for an object sliding down an incline, we would say that the force of kinetic friction, considering it's sliding, would be up and parallel to the incline. So the frictional force always opposes the motion of the object. In this video, I've gone over in detail the force of kinetic friction, force of static friction. We've looked at it graphically. We talked about that maximum threshold, and we also talked about how to experimentally determine the coefficients of frictions. And I'll see you guys in class.